Uh, I think yeah. I believe I believe we're live. Um, for people yeah. watching the streams, um, if you can see us and we are live, can someone comment and tell us that we are? Because that would be nice. Okay, we've got a yes, so I guess we're live. Um, thank you, everyone um, around the world, truly around the world, um, for joining us today on, on this panel. It is 3.30 in Thailand, 4.30 in Malaysia and Shanghai, 3.30 in the morning on the East Coast, and midnight in California, and that's where our panelists are today. So apologies to the people staying up late in the middle of the night just to join this panel, but thank you so much for being here. Um, today's panel discussion is about the impact of the recent U.S. elections on Asia. Um, because we're a more economic-minded forum, this, this will largely focus on the economic, but we can always touch on the political as well. Um, I'm pleased to have with us um, Vijay Azrawan of the Chi or QI group, depending on who you ask. Um, he'll tell you more about that in a second. Harry Wee, who's out of Shanghai with Clearview Partners. Ganjan Sinha with Metric Stream out of Palo Alto in California. And Ron Somers, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the India First Group, and he is in Washington, D.C. Gentlemen, could you be briefly introduce yourself and your company and, and how it relates to the topic? Let's start with Vijay. Um, QI Group uh, basically started about 98. Uh, we based out of Hong Kong. We are an e-commerce uh, operation somewhat in the style of uh, Amazon or Alibaba, and uh, we operate in some hundred over countries across the globe. We have about 18 million customers worldwide. And in essence, um, we are both an e-commerce platform as well as we are into direct sales, manufacturing, and a whole host of other activities. So uh, having worked and studied and lived in the U.S. for nearly a decade, I have some um, input into that as well. So in a nutshell, uh, it will be a very interesting discussion. I'm looking forward to it. Harry, could you go next? Yeah, sure. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Harry Kui. Um I'm based in Shanghai, um, where everything is kind of back to normal and uh, things are getting busy again. Uh, in some ways, I actually missed the COVID because it was a little bit of uh, good quality of life then. Um, but um, I am uh, I run a private equity firm called Clearview Partners, and we focus on the consumption thesis of China. And uh, so we have invested into 30 companies over the last eight years. We manage about a billion U.S. dollars of uh, assets under management, everything in uh, health tech, marketing tech, e-commerce, uh, automotive, and education. And I guess the one point I wanted to open up with with this panel is that um, what's really interesting is that uh, China is going to be very likely the only one of um, uh, the industrialized nation that's going to see a growth in GDP, while the rest of the world is looking for a contraction. And uh, that represents and uh, actually presents some very interesting investment opportunities uh, in the market in this election. Uh, it's going to have some impact uh, to this uh, thesis. Perfect. Thank you, Harry. Um, Gunjan, do you want to go next? Yeah, no, sure. Hi, I'm Gunjan Senha, and I'm the chairman of Metricstream, one of the global leaders in risk management software. I've been in Silicon Valley for the last 30 plus years and been a kind of a quintessential entrepreneur, creating companies and, and building companies globally. So nice to be here on the panel. Sorry, my mic shut off by itself for a second. Um, thank you, Gunjan. And finally, Ron, could you do uh, an introduction as well? Yes, hello, everybody. Good morning. It's 3.30 in the morning in Washington, D.C., and it's been a great program so far. I, I've had an opportunity to listen in to a number of different panels. Um, I'm with India First Group. This is a firm that I began in 2014 after running the U.S. India Business Council for 10 years here in Washington, D.C., and that is the largest uh, Bilateral Business Association advancing commercial ties between the United States and another country. So I'm very proud of, of how that has grown and, and how that has taken shape. Uh, the U.S.-India relationship is going to be key to my comments this evening. 
Uh, and then prior to that, I lived in India for 12 years. So that's my good luck. It really had given me a nice anchor in the Asia region. I worked earlier in Indonesia to that. But the bottom line is uh, South Asia was where I really spent my, my biggest part of my career. I still do. And uh, I look forward to commenting tonight about how the U.S. elections will have an impact on Asia. Thank you. Perfect. So let's start off with the... Um the, the, the elephant in the room. It's now November 30th. Um, the current U.S. president has still not yet fully conceded, even though the results over the last few days have pointed to a likely Biden presidency. Donald Trump, over the last four years, has brought his own unique brand to the White House and the Oval Office. And I am wondering, for each of the panelists now, how has the Trump presidency affected your business, and how has it affected the U.S. relationships with the countries that you deal with in Asia, whether economically or politically, whatever you want to touch on. I think the most, I think we could start with Harry because, because China is obviously one of the big talking points that, that Trump has uh, addressed over the course of his presidency. How, how, what has his impact been in China? Yeah, I guess a couple of key points. Uh, uh, the first thing is that uh, I think we could largely say that uh, we here in China can breathe a sigh of relief that the uh, the last administration is behind us. Uh, the second point is that uh, there is uh, anticipation and a bit of more optimism now in the country to working with an administration that will likely bring about more predictability and um, more towards... Um, hopefully globalization and multilateralism, which has served everybody well. Um, the tariffs that the Trump administration has put on China has now largely since May of 2018 been deemed uh, or viewed as uh, ineffective in that it really has changed very much. Uh, the, um, it has now been merely a tax on the U.S. consumer and the export numbers out of China have in fact gone up in the same period and the deficit hasn't really gone away. So I think there is a little bit of um, uh, a maturity and uh, there's a little bit of a positive anticipation uh, going forward that uh, this new administration is going to bring things back to a little bit more normality. In my recent meetings with uh, various ambassadors and uh, council generals from US and Europe, um, I actually also noted that there has been a shift in tone uh, in the conversation and the discussion, uh, a little bit more of uh, rationality rather than the irrational rivalry that we have been seeing for the last four years. Um, so hopefully um, uh, the, the performance of the country uh, during the COVID has also proven that uh, it has beaten the pandemic. And uh, now that the country is back on track and things are back to normality, uh, it also represents a very, very good area of opportunities to invest, particularly in many countries around the world where they're living in negative interest rate territories. So I'll stop there. Perfect. Thank you. I mean, that's that's really interesting. Obviously, we kind of saw the impact of Trump on, on China. It, it's made headlines for the past three years, four years. But but that's not necessarily the case with every country in Asia, right? The, some, some countries have welcomed the Trump presidency. I mean, India's Modi has been quite friendly with Trump. I mean, Ron, do you want to expand on that just a little yeah, bit? Let me jump in. and I can offer an interesting counterpoint in the sense that I think Trump has been uh, exceptionally good for the U.S.-India relationship. And um, I think a recent example, and we need to discuss it, is the, this whole quadrilateral dialogue that's underway to basically offer an alternative to the assertiveness that China has been flexing. And when I say China, I, I mean the CCP, I mean the government, I don't mean the people of China, but there have been a lot of incidents in the region that if you go back to 2017 at the Bhutan border, Doklam, that had a big impact on India. It reminded them uh, right to the present uh, of the old war uh, that they had with China back in 1961. Uh, we've seen the Hong Kong uh, fiasco take place in, in recent months. Uh, we've seen, uh, we continue to see the, the expansion of the South China Sea. So I think what you're going to see, whether it's a Biden presidency or a Trump presidency, you're going to continue to see 
an alignment among nations that have an interest in democracy in that region to be uh, looking out for the Indo-Pacific. And therefore, the Quad, Australia, uh, Japan, India, and the United States are going to, I believe, expand that grouping of democratic nations saying, how do we want a rules-based order to protect the Indo-Pacific and to keep democracy afloat, so to speak. So I think you're going to see, I think that was a, a nice starting point for the Trump administration. I think they, they helped cement ties in the region on this level. And the Quad is up and running. And I think Joe Biden, being the former chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, when I knew him and first met him, when he helped pass the U.S.-India civil nuclear deal, uh, Joe Biden is going to be, I think, very much uh, aligned with what Trump started with the Quad and, and actually carry it forward. Do you think? Do you think because of, of the issues that you mentioned, not to mention human rights concerns in places like Xinjiang, do you think that that the Senate's going to pressure a Biden presidency to not engage too closely with China economically as as things were before in the Bush and, and Obama years? Do you think there's no going back to those 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 economic high points? Let, let me let me allow this to segue to my other colleagues on the panel. But my personal experience was has been in the last nine months. I've been working with a client, Gilead Sciences, uh, which is actively licensing their antiviral drug remdesivir to seven Indian companies who have been extraordinary in being able to to scale up and produce volumes of of remdesivir for 127 countries in the the South Southeast Asia region. And and at at a lower, lower price because of the generic capabilities that India holds, and, and what I see happening is I, I see a, a kind of a concern about China, uh, unreliability factor, the possibility now all companies, American companies, are thinking about how do we decouple gently and how do we retrench ourselves? Let's take a, a second closer look at India. And I'm not talking about pharmaceuticals. I'm talking about all kinds of companies are thinking about how do we now realign with India how do we do more in India? And I see the real beneficiaries also being Vietnam and Thailand. So as I, as I watch COVID take place and the Indian uh, pharmaceutical industry step up to be able to offer the remdesivir to 127 countries around the world by virtue of this generic, this licensing arrangement, voluntary licensing arrangement between Gilead and these companies, uh, I, see, I see many companies now thinking, how do we now retrench in the region and look outside from from where we had been looking, which is almost exclusively China. They're now looking at other opportunities in the region. I, okay. Uh, excuse me. I didn't know we were going to get into a p- political debate this early. So do I get a moment to respond to that? Um, can we can we segue back to it? Um, yes, so, sure. I, you I, know have what? I have a completely contrarian view to what the other panelists just said a moment ago. So uh, let uh, so let me know when I can respond. Okay, absolutely. So, sorry about that. I, I'm glad it's getting political because that means the discussion is being had. But to my other colleagues on the panel, um, Gunjan and Vijay, um, recently the regional comprehensive economic Jesus um, economic partnership was signed. It's the world's largest free trade agreement, and it was signed without the United States because the Trump presidency pulled the U.S. out of the TPP. Um, does it have an impact on on what you're doing? And do you think Biden tries to re-engage with the region in some sort of counter move with their own free trade agreements coming in? Yeah, Vijay, do you want to go or? Sure, I I can. This fits into our area as well. Uh, basically, in insofar as the RCEP is concerned and the TPP, both are very. Uh, powerful. In fact, the RCEP is the largest trade agreement of its kind. It has brought together the largest trade group grouping uh, in history. And for the U.S. not to be part of it would be counterproductive, I imagine. I can see why Trump would, uh, you know, do what he did. But I would imagine that Biden would try to uh, build bridges as opposed to walls. I mean, Trump is famous for his walls one way or the other. Now, having said that, uh, in, insofar as the decoupling is concerned, uh, to decouple China and the U.S., uh, which has uh, 
basically taken decades to evolve into the relationship that they have today, is not going to be something that's going to leave the U.S. unaffected. No, is it going to leave the rest of the world unaffected? So I think the deep coupling per se is a, is a topic that perhaps needs to be discussed a lot further. Quad by itself, if you take a look at the members of Quad, each of the members of Quad, every one of them have China as their biggest trading partner. So that's interesting to know. You know, be it Australia, be it India, be it, you know, they're, they're the biggest China, China, one way or the other, has become the factory of the world. And uh, through the Belt and Silk Road Initiative, they have really uh, built infrastructure, built relationships all across the world. Now, the only thing that we need to take into account here is to recognize that there was a time that, uh, you know, the U.S., since Kennedy onwards, has been a world global player. Today, they are looking at the U.S. with a lot of trepidation. And uh, Biden can cure that, but not by continuing with, you know, the sledgehammer approach, which has been, you know, basically a Trump's uh, major approach to everything. And the only thing that's missing in Trump's policy so far, insofar as I'm concerned, is, is that there's no coherent policy to it. You know, the, the, what would be required is a coherent policy with regards to, you know, uh, trade and uh, to being a global partner. The U.S. is not isolated. It's not Fortress America. Making America first has a cost, and it is a very significant cost. The poverty in the U.S. prior to Trump and now has gone up. And with COVID, it's going to be uh, a serious wasteland out there, economic wasteland out there, uh, when we all eventually come out of it. There's no country that's going to be left unaffected, including, including China. Although China's... South Korea, Taiwan, even Hong Kong and Japan are coming out of this somewhat better than the other nations. It's going to take a, a correlated effort, a collaborative effort to be able to bring trade back to some level of coherent, coherency. You know, uh, trade is all about win-win. This is not a war. This is entirely about building bridges. And ultimately, the only people who benefit when we do build bridges are on both sides of the bridge. So I'm of the opinion that the thing that makes Biden work and the hope that we have in terms of Biden coming to power is simply that he is not Trump. So in a nutshell, you know, we are experiencing, we are expecting and hoping for a more coherent, more logical, uh, more global approach to dealing with our problems, be it with India or otherwise. I am not in any way here coming forward to say that um, you know, China or China's policies or its human right record or, you know, I'm from Hong Kong. So in essence, uh, be it uh, any of those issues, but one cannot ignore China. Moving forward, we have to find ways to work with China. And that is, uh, you know, in a nutshell, what I think we need to do. Ganjan, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, a great conversation. And I, I would firstly note that, you know, t you know what uh, one of the points that Harry mentioned, and I would say that, you know, the, the tariffs, while they were initiated with whatever intentions were behind it, you know, they haven't really done the work that they were supposed to do in the first place. So I, I would kind of concur with the view. And I think the point which is very clear now is that, the, you know, with the Biden administration, you're going to see more openness to bilateral dialogue with China. That's going to start. And I was actually on a Zoom call with Biden and Susan Rice, who at the time was potentially being considered for Secretary of State. This was last Sunday before the election. And believe it or not, he was talking to the CEOs in Silicon Valley and 60 minutes, 45 of the 60 minutes was on U.S.-China relations. Yeah. What that's telling us is that that's going to be the next four years is going to be a lot of this is going to be while there's domestic issues in U.S. like the mm -hmm. pandemic and all the, you know, the economic plight and everything else. There's going to be a huge conversation around U.S., China and China global relations and how that, that how is that going to be approached in Biden era? And I think he is going to take a very front and center approach to what I call more orthodox policy approach. I think, you know, Vijay, you touched upon that more traditional approaches, but approaches that have been proven to work, like multilateral approaches of, of creating trade pacts and so forth. But they're going to be fundamentally, you know, creating a competitive strategy that's going to 
A, decouple US-China to a certain level and then build, you know, kind of US competitiveness back to a level which US aspires to attain. But this geopolitical kind of uh, strategy is going to play itself out in the next four years. And whether he gets a second term or not, is going to wholly else quite a bit depend on how this issue gets handled. And uh, it was interesting to me that for, for 45 to 60 minute conversation was on US-China, the IP risks were the front and center. Right. How you deal with Taiwan <clears throat> was an issue, especially with the, all the dependence on semiconductor companies, with you know companies like TSMC and so forth. So, so the so the good part is the dialogue will become the US will get a much more multilateral approach, and the the whole IP risks, the climate risks, the market access, all those issues will be on the table. But you know, I do think it will be less volatile, more orthodox, and a policy based approach rather than just rhetoric and combative. Uh, kind of methods which normally do not work, and and I think you know you're going to see some real focus germinate around how you deal with a more greener agenda on U.S. Uh, you know the environmental regulations and how it enforces globally will be on the surface, and I think there'll be you know some of the Chinese companies, for example, in the solar side will be beneficiaries of that. So it's not going to be all negative. I think it's going to play out, play itself out. Uh, positively in certain sectors and in some sectors they're going to be hit hard and and I think that's going to be the way the winners and the losers are going to get kind of defined because there is an opening of venture capital for example from Chinese companies into US pharma companies you know that might you know there's there's hopes for that opening up and I and as it pertains to you know India and other countries I do think Indian alliance with uh, US is going to further strength and I do know that Trump and Modi had a great Kind of relationship, but I do think Biden, you know, will continue to cement that relationship very, very strongly in in a different way, and and it's going to continue to be a strong regional ally, uh, no matter what. And I think it, it it builds that alliance in in spirit of democracy, but also you know as as a as a center for investments, a lot of U.S. companies to you know bet on India as the future uh, hub for innovation. So I think that's what I'm seeing from my vantage point as. As we see metric stream, you know, in the risk business, we are looking at helping companies globally on risk and geopolitical risk is at the front and center. And as I talk to people around the world, uh, these topics do emerge very frequently. So I'll turn that over with, with that perspective. Gunjan and DJ and Harry and, and Ka, just, just one interjection, and, and it's a qualification. Let, let me be clear. I, I, I think the decoupling that I see from an industry standpoint is really – based on the fact that I, I, I think many companies were caught very flat-footed with the pandemic coming on, where they didn't realize how dependent they were on supply chains that were far beyond their control. So what I'm suggesting here is you're going to see a lot of retrenchment happening by companies from a company standpoint, not from a U.S. government policy standpoint, just to make certain that they have Plan B in place in the event we have another kind of a, a pandemic or other kind of shutdown. So when you think of PPE, when you think of, 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 of API, the active pharmaceutical ingredients which make remdesivir, my goodness, how many companies were caught flat-footed, unable to be able to produce or react to the virus when, in fact, everything was, was far beyond their control? And, and one last point, and it's a positive point. I really do believe that, that India is going to play a major role in helping disperse the vaccine or the vaccines that are going to be soon coming to market to the rest of the world. And that's another story and another day. But India has proved extraordinary uh, agility to be able to go to markets and places where no other companies could even think of going and get medicine that's very high quality at lowest possible cost to people who need it most. That's an extraordinary tribute to, to Indian business and Indian pharma. Harry, your rebuttal. Uh, Harry. Yeah, um, yeah, look, it's not, it's not really a debate uh, and so forth, but let, let me offer a couple of statistics. Um, at the recent American Chamber of Commerce survey in China, amongst all of its CEO that's doing approximately $500 billion of revenue, and in a recent survey amongst all of the European Chamber of Commerce that's doing about 550 billion euros of business, on their chances 
or plans and intentions of decoupling in the next three years. The statistics came back to 85 and 90% resounding no. <laughs> so there's a lot of rhetoric about decoupling as if you can light switch this and simply move your factory out and have them go to a new different country, have the roads, the infrastructure, logistics, freight costs, and so forth, magically appear as if this is some easy move. It's just not realistic. And it's also not a government decision. No government incentives, as much as Abe has said, move back because the Japanese government will pay for it. Well, nobody's taken up that offer. So I think that uh, decoupling should be redefined in terms of diversification. And I think this has already happened. This Fair was point. happening before the trade war, and this is going to continue to happen now that the trade war and tariffs are behind us. Apple will build factories in Vietnam, will build factories in India, but they're not going to take factories necessarily out of one market and move to another market. That's the simple diversification. And as the former CEO of a multinational company, that's what you should do. But let's not make it a zero-sum game. So that's my first point about decoupling. Um, and, and the second point I want to make is that I actually agree with the India First gentleman that India is in a very, very good geopolitical sweet spot. I mean, it's shifted away from a non-alignment agenda to now an alignment platform that hasn't done so in decades, and it could stand to benefit immensely in the next decades to come. But it also doesn't have to be a irrational competition because it could be peaceful rise for everybody. So I don't think it needs to be this irrational, um, um, unpredictable rhetoric that we've seen in the last four years, because it's not winner takes all. It is globalization, and globalization has proven to be very, very successful and good for everybody in the last 70 years. But Harry, let's not make this, let's not make this just a U.S.-China discussion. I mean, China has been on the border of India, up in Kashmir and, and up in Ladakh and over in Doklam and Bhutan and pressing on the borders. I mean, there's been a lot of tensions created between other countries other than the United States by China. And one would wonder, my goodness, if this is the if this is China's rise, which we celebrate, is this the direction we want to go where we all kind of have to tolerate this kind of new assertiveness, which is which is concerning. And, and if you're sitting there as the foreign secretary or foreign minister of India, you've got to be wondering what's happening to the north. It's not a pleasant experience, I'm sure. Well, I, I would be taught. Can, can, I, can I interject for a I second? And just I would be taught to not come in this way. Whilst you're talking about the concern about an assertive China, why don't you reflect on the assertiveness of Western countries around the world? Why don't you <laughs> reflect on the Western aggressiveness around the world and how the rise of the Roman Empire, the rise of the Athenian Empire, the rise of the German Empire, the rise of the Japanese Empire, the rise of the Ottoman Empire has always led to warfare. But not a single shot of war has happened in the last 40 years. So why do you single out and isolate <laughs> that as if this is an inevitable? You're only picking a war with yourself. My, my, my question to the panel is thus is this. Um, China is getting more assertive. That's that much is clear to be seen. The U.S. has retreated from the region in in certain ways and has upped its rhetoric under the Trump campaign, even as it retreats militarily from the region. That's also a fact. What I want to know is, under a Biden presidency, to get us back on topic, do we see the U.S. Reasser reasserting its its military, its economic, its political forces to the region, or does it continue its retreat? I see your hand, Gunjan, you can go yeah, ahead. Yeah. No, and, and I, I'll tell you from my vantage point and what, you know, I see the signals coming out from Washington, D.C. and is is definitely, you know, maybe the, the, the combative approach that, you know, Trump had in words and the volatility that he carried, maybe that will subside to a more orthodox, more traditional style of diplomacy, but I do think that you're going to see an accelerated tone of soft power and hard power diplomacy from Washington, D.C. And this is going to be the center stage of the Biden administration for the next four years to, to show 
And and one of the advantages Biden has, he's seen what didn't work in Obama administration. He was the vice president. He got his you know grooming there as the number two executive in in the Oval Office. So he understands what didn't work. He also saw what Trump did, and it, and the cause and effect of the tariffs, for example, to Harris Point. Some things do not work when you do it just in a blunt way, you know. So there is going to be sophistication here, and but it's going to be a game of chess. Which is going to be played with a combination of soft power and hard power coming together, and I think that's fair play in global globalization. And U.S. is going to take it very seriously. And I and I do believe that, you know, depending on how well a job he does, he either comes back for the round two in the second term or he doesn't. And I think that's that's the test which is in front, which the elect both bipartisan groups are going to in U.S. are going to count on that, and that we are hearing that discussion already in the circuits in Silicon Valley and Washington D.C. for sure. But do you do you agree, though, Gunjan, that uh, and again, let's be careful of the wording. But the reality is, you're going to see a Biden presidency if he becomes a president uh, have a view on China that is different than any view that was taken during the Obama administration. In other words, uh, actions by China in the last four to six years have caused Joe Biden to evolve in understanding that there's a new kind of a China that had not been there previously. The same yeah, no, for yeah. India as well, Robin. Yeah. So I do believe that, you know, China today is different than China was four years back or six years back. So the markets have evolved, the, you know, the forces of, you know, kind of, uh, of how the global trade works, that's has evolved. And I think, you know, people have understood what doesn't work. I mean, a lot of what Trump well, did, even if the intentions were, you know, fair, you know, it didn't pan out the same way. But part of the part of this, this game is going to require... You know, assertiveness on U.S. part in a different way. To maybe it's multilateralism. Maybe it's going to be more investment in trade, more securing supply chains properly for the U.S. businesses and even businesses. You know, we are seeing third-party risk management as one of the themes. And you know, Metrisim serves many of the global multinationals, and our software now is being used for third-party risk management. And and again, I do agree here with Harry's view that it's not going to be displacement out of China as much as it's going to be diversification. Because you've got to start thinking about multiple destinations where you're going to do manufacturing or service chains you're going to build. Vijay, Vijay, so you can clearly see that this conversation has become about the U.S.-China. Yes, yes, yes. (laughs) And as the two people who live in Southeast Asia from ASEAN countries here... What does a Biden presidency mean to ASEAN people? Because obviously the com- the conversation for the next four years will be China, India, and the U.S. For yeah. us, where do we stand? How do we manage well, uh, what's going forward? Comment first to Ron. Uh, his comment on uh, the fact that Biden has to deal with a new China, uh, the same could be said for India. Because uh, India uh, under Obama has also evolved. And it is a different India today. And having said that, uh, the fact of the matter is India needs to also think in terms of opening up. It's, it's, it's been so long non-aligned. It hasn't learned to build bridges. And therefore, because of that, I mean, ignoring the great opportunity that the RCEP, uh, they pulled out in November, which to me is, is a blunder. You see, India needs to open its borders. India needs to, you know, work harder on, you know, becoming a global trading partner that it wants to be. Now, if it wants to, it has to open its dialogue. And ASEAN is right there on its uh, doorstep. ASEAN is India's doorstep as much as it is China's. And, uh, you know, China has worked very actively uh, to keep at at least the Indo-Chinese segment of ASEAN actively engaged. You know, be it Thailand or Myanmar or Laos or Vietnam, for that matter, and Cambodia in particular. They have worked uh, extremely hard in, in building bridges over there. Now, India has the greatest uh, entry into these markets because linguistically, culturally, traditionally, even, you know, uh, spiritually and so on, they are all interlinked. And uh, the fact that India is not making inroads into ASEAN, to me, which is right there in its in its threshold. Let's be real about this. The real challenge is not going to be the northern border between India and China. That's been going on. Those skirmishes, that saber rattling has been going on for decades. It's been there, you know, long before I was born. So let me point out to you 
That is China. China is going to save a rattle because it's part of its strategy. But China also has been constructively and industrially building ports, airports, you know, infrastructure right across Asia into Central Asia on into Africa. Today, China, Africa has become China's back door. And that is also because India was looking the other way. It was India that was ahead of China two decades ago in yeah. Africa. You know, so if you want to uh, pick on that, that would be something good. If someone can get this message across to India, Ron, I seriously hope you would try because they need to open up. They need to understand that the world moving on ahead. What has happened here? I understand with your, your point on, uh, you know, the fact that uh, supply chains across the world have been scattered, shattered and so on. At the same time, Amazingly, Amazon has tripled its business. So has, you know, every other e-commerce, you know, company out there. And they are, they are delivering to your doorstep, wherever you are. I just bought something from your neck of the woods and it was delivered to me yesterday. And, and it, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, we talked about the nationalization that happened under Trump, but under the sphere of e-commerce, there has been an international, there's been a globalization that's been operating at a phenomenal rate. And today, moving forward, as many of these companies that you're talking about, Ron, that had to basically, you know, close the shutters or whatever, because they're dealing with the fact they don't have the supply chains. As many as that is happening, there is also equally that many companies that are switching over, making full use of e-commerce and recognizing they could be in Kansas and still deliver, you know, right across the world uh, here to Malaysia or to Japan or wherever they could be. They need to see the world. What, what they need to see right now, Ron, is seriously they need to see the world as their marketplace, which China I, I, saw two decades ago. Uh, I find it worrying that my question about ASEAN also went back to India, China, and the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> which, which tells you everything you need to know about where the next four years are headed. Um, Asia. We're we're opening we're opening the floor up to questions because we have ten minutes left. Forty five minutes is honestly not enough time to talk about this topic. We could probably go for two hours, but uh, we are so. If people in the audience, if you have a question, just type it into the comment section, and I'll read it out to our panelists. Um, as we're getting started, let me let me let me play the devil's advocate for a second and ask my question to Harry. Harry, obviously. A lot of the people on the panel and a lot of the people that attend Horasis are very involved in the business and economic side of, of things and, and a stable, um, prosperous relationship between countries is beneficial to trade. Um, do you think that with the direction that the CCP has been heading with the saber rattling, it makes it more difficult for people like yourself to engage in cross-border trade? Or do you think there, it's been Teflon coded and you don't feel that impact so much over the last four or five years? Um, so, look, I, I don't represent the government. I don't speak on behalf of the government. I can only offer my uh, observation and point of view on, on the ground and doing business here. I think um, on the ground and on the business is that uh, I often hear the term saber rattling. Um, but um, I think it's important to distinguish to which audience these messages are being sent to. Uh, the messages that the government seems to be very clearly promoting to the world and to the audience domestically are two things. They want to continue and preserve globalization. And in China, they want to continue to have a dual circulation. So you could only see by you could judge a government by the policy changes that it's going on. I mean, there's an old saying, right? In America, you could change parties but you don't change policies. In China, you can't change the par party, but you're seeing a lot of changes in policies. So to Ron's point earlier, the America of six, seven, eight years ago is very different than the America today. The China today is very different than the China of six, seven years ago. And as we continue to evolve, you're gonna see that China is going to look to defend its interests, depend, defend its rights. And um, so I think that's only natural. Um, but on balance, you would have to say that, um, take the COVID as an example. During the COVID, China was the laughing stock of the world when the virus first began in Wuhan. 
everybody ridiculed the lockdown policy. CNN, BBC, everybody globally ridiculed the country when very, very little information or imperfect information was going on. And yet, when it emerged and came out of it, has there been any media around the world that's given it any credit? <laughs> and so in that sense, I think you have to be perhaps a little bit balanced in assessing what it is saying and what it is doing and ask, the self, ask yourself the question, uh, is your view of China an updated view of China? And second of all, does China have a right to defend its interests outside of China? Um, and if so, to what extent? And so, look, I'm not saying that everything that China does is perfect. There are lots of problems, and I can go on with a list of all of the, the problems and issues that the country has to deal with. But all I'm saying is that when you go from a non-existing economic power to now the second largest power and uh, uh, large, uh, second largest economy in the world, it's going to have to have a voice, and it's and now. If it's not understood and it's viewed as saber rattling, then I think this is where China has to have, and I say this all the time, China has a PR problem and China needs to do much, much more to communicate and to be much more transparent and to be much more communicative with the Western world. And I think if we embrace that type of mentality, um, then we could get to a better place. Perfect. Great answer. Um First question is Ron's view on India not joining RCEP. Um, you know, I don't know what happened there because you're right. So it was a recent decision. But the, the bottom line is, is, uh, is any administration, whether Trump or Biden, are they going to revive a TPP-like alternative and then invite some of these same countries, all of these countries, back into the to that discussion? That would be interesting to me. Uh, because I want to just correct one point of the earlier conversation. Uh, it wasn't Trump that killed TPP. Yes, that became part of his, his campaign back in 2000, back when he was running in term one. But the reality is Hillary Clinton also killed TPP. I mean, they realized that politically was not viable at that time. Uh, and, and so it, it died its own death. The question now is with our, our, our step out there, is there going to be any trade initiative that offers an alternative in the region that could be beneficial to everybody? So all boats rise in a rising tide because clearly it's Asia's, uh, Asia is going to be the focus and the Indo-Pacific is going to be the focus. So all eyes are on Asia, guys. This is where the action is going to be. Okay. To the panel now, um, what is the best way, best possible way forward for India and China to move ahead together? Who wants to take this one? Dialogue. Dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> in, in one way, dialogue. They're not communicating. They're, they're talking a lot, but they're not communicating. And that has uh, always been uh, their essential problem. Uh, but uh, having said that, ASEAN can play a very important role because both of them have to recognize uh, the, the capability that ASEAN brings to the table, the potential. 600 million people, the fastest growing economy, uh, you know, economic base in the world and, and the fastest to move to digitalization. So uh, one cannot ignore that. So with both Vietnam and Indonesia, that it makes it extremely powerful. Vijay, my question to you for me now is, do you think it makes sense that, that uh, does ASEAN need to get together to form a stronger negotiating block instead of, instead of being so individual even now? even with us in integration? Absolutely. I mean, it, it needs it more than ever before. ASEAN itself is basically has a north-south divide, and that needs to be bridged. Uh, Malaysia plays a very important role in being able to do that because the one country that has a commonality between the north and the south, and, it, and let's not forget the first prime minister in Asia was from Canada. So there you have it. <laughs> he was born... I mean, basically, he had a Thai mom, so that made him half Thai. Uh, and that meant that uh, there is a great hope for the region if we came together and put aside our differences. Okay, I'm going to let Gunjan finish off. Besides COVID, 